Our next speaker is Professor Gérard Mourou, who is a French scientist and a pioneer in the field of laser physics. He was born in June 1944 in Albertville in the French Alps, a town probably best known for hosting the 1992 Winter Olympics, at least until now. Mourou started his career in physics at the University of Grenoble Alp, getting his diploma in 1967 and moving on to first Quebec and then Paris to work on his doctoral thesis. He received his doctorate from Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris in 1973. Gérard Mourou spent a large part of his career in the United States, in particular at the Laboratory for Laser Energetics at the University of Rochester, New York, where one of his doctoral students, as we just heard, was Donna Strickland. Together, the pair devised the chirp pulse amplification technique, which today is at the core of most high-powered laser facilities in the world. In 1988, Mourou joined the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where he founded the Center for Ultrafast Optical Science. He returned to France in 2005 and became the director of the Laboratory of Applied Optics at the campus of École Polytechnique in Palaiso, a post which he held until 2008. Mourou is a visionary, aiming to create lasers with unprecedented power he initiated the multi-petawatt Apollon laser project in France and coordinates the large European extreme light infrastructure, ELI, that will host even more powerful lasers in Romania, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. He's currently also the field director of ICES, the International Center for Zeta and Exawatt Science and Technology, established in France in 2011, to, among other things, develop the field of laser-based particle physics. Gérard Mourou has been the recipient of many prestigious prizes, but I dare say that this year's Nobel Prize must be the icing on the cake. With that, I'd like to invite Professor Mourou to join me on stage to give a talk staking out the future of high-intensity lasers. Professor Mourou. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming, uh, friends, colleagues, former students, and so on. Well, it's always a dangerous act, you know, to act up behind uh, uh, Donna, you know. <laughs> anyway, but I'm going to try, Donna. <laughs> it's also a pleasure because there is many, many of my students in the audience students or co-worker, co co and for me it's very refreshing. It's like, you know, when, when we had our group meetings, you know, at, uh, at Rochester, at Michigan, and so on. Anyway, so um, I, uh, I'm going to tell you, um, can we have, can we blow this the picture a little bit bigger? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so I, I'm going really to to talk about my passion, my passion about extreme light. So Donna gave you all the background, how to build these high-intensity lasers and so on. You don't need much more than that, okay? And uh, so, but I'm going to tell you what you can do with that, okay? Uh, because it's true that uh, uh, it's only, only recently that we had this phenomenal uh, uh, in, uh, intensity available, and so there is many new discovery uh, which are being made. Okay, so um, that's my passion for light. Okay, and um, so uh, do I have? How, why does it work? Okay, I can maybe act. Okay, I can I can act here. Yeah. So everything, like Donna said, everything, and started from with Ted Mehman, you know, in 19, 
1960. Um, and um, I'm sorry. Yes. And there's one thing, you know, which really strikes me about, about light is a variety of things you can do, okay? And as uh, uh, Art Ashkin, I'm sorry, showed, but what you can do, you know, first thing is that maybe you can slow down atoms. And it's a very, very uh, 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 interesting phenomenon we have seen with the tweezers and so on. And uh, this, um, it doesn't work, it's okay. Um, so, uh, people, uh, you know, used it intensively, were very successfully, and trying to really use the light to decelerate atoms. And that led to the field of uh, quantum optics and cold atoms. And you have Steve Chu in, uh, in the first uh, row here, which got the Nobel Prize with Cohen Tanuji and also um, uh, Bill Phillips. And so that led this, this fact that we can really uh, squ uh, slow down the atoms uh, to very, very uh, small times um, uh, velocity. Very important. It's uh, another way to say that it's, uh, it's a way also to make it uh, atoms very cold and rich temperatures, you know, which are, I think, the, the coldest temperature we can produce now. Okay, now, the other thing you can do, and this is what is exciting, okay, you can do just the opposite. You can accelerate particles. And, uh, um, and you can accelerate particles, like electrons, for instance, to the speed of light, or very close to the speed of light. Okay? And, uh, and this led, really, to a new field, which we call relativistic optics. I will tell you why we call relativistic optics in a minute. We know that light is relativistic, of course, per definition, almost. And, and so that, uh, the fact that we can now accelerate particles to the speed of light, then led, of course, now to an enormous field, uh, you know, which deals with uh, accelerator physics, nuclear physics, cosmology, nonlinear QED, general relativity, extra dimension physics, you name it. Very large, very large physics. Okay, so I don't have to go uh, to talk about CPA. We heard uh, Donna uh, saying it, you know, of course, we, uh, because we are going to need CPA, of course, to, to, of course, to accelerate this particle and so on. So, I, uh, uh, so CPA, you know, we stretch the pulse, we amplify, we compress it. And, it's, uh, and finally, in order to get very short pulses. I'd like to say one thing, you know, because it's a very, it was a completely novel concept at the time. And uh, because everybody, as you've seen, uh, was into dye lasers, okay? Especially the guys at Bell Lab at that time. And, uh, and, and here we came with, uh, with uh, Donna with solid state lasers. And, uh, so it was, it didn't grab uh, the attention uh, of, of many people, except, I will say, a couple of one. One, for instance, was Suni Swanberg, who just visited my lab, uh, because he had a hint that was very something special. And also, I, I had the visit of people from uh, 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 Laurence Livermore Laboratory, uh, Mike Campbell, and so on. Mike is in, in the audience because, he, like me, they understood immediately that it was something important for, uh, for uh, uh, power, uh, increasing the power of lasers. Okay, so now, with this CPA technique, what is fascinating is you can really produce very, very high peak power, and we are going to use this high power, uh, I will show you in a minute. But uh, just to give you a sense, uh, the power, the peak power, okay, 
of the, the light is in a peta, in, now it's in a petawatt range, okay? Which is about a thousand times the total power of, of the worldwide grid, so global grid, grid, okay? But of course, for femtoseconds, you know, 10 minus 15 seconds. But nevertheless, it's extremely important. And uh, if you take now this power, you know, this petawatt power, and you focus it, like Donna said, over on, on, a, on a spot size, which is a wavelength of light. You cannot really go f uh, less than that, so typically a mi micrometers or so. Then you get a fabulous amount of energy density on a very small spot. And this, of course, you know, led, is leading to absolutely new application. Just to give you an idea, okay, uh, light, like uh, the first speaker showed, and uh, Art, Art uh, Ashin uh, used, showed, used, and was fascinated by, you know, uh, really deliver pressures. And, but when you are talking about uh, pressure uh, light at a petawatt level, when you focus that on a small subpart size, you can really produce uh, pressures which is correspond to about 10 million Eiffel Tower on the top of your finger. So it is the largest pressure that you can produce on Earth is with light, with photons. This is amazing. So now this is really uh, the evolutions of uh, intensity as a function of years. Okay? From the 1960, from the 1960, where uh, Mayman invented the laser and the first five five, less than, uh, less, uh, first ten years, uh, new technique improved uh, the, the power and the more Q switching, more locking, and then the, the intensity plateaued. It plateaued because, like Donna said, you know, you are damaging. You, if you go higher, you are damaging your, your, uh, your laser inside, you know, your you, you damage, you're putting this nice big track, you know, in your, your solid state uh, amplifier, and you, of course, makes your uh, advisor very unhappy, right, uh, Donna? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she learned the hard way, yeah. So, anyway, so in order to prevent Donna making mistake, <laughs> I said, well, Bef you know, that's not the way to do it. Let's do it this way. Okay, let's try to, let's invent the CPA, okay? So she wouldn't try damage uh, what anymore. Okay, so, uh, so we, we did, um, she built it, and uh, the CPA, and then we, we could really now, we are not limited by, by the, the uh, breakdowns of uh, material, of, uh, and, but, and we could really climb up now the intensities. And now, I mean, since the 85, when we did it, the intensity, I have to say, has increased enormously, okay? Uh, eight or nine orders of magnitude, okay? And it's going to go further up, okay? With, uh, uh, with lasers like Apollon that is being built, Lasers, which, which is part of the Eli infrastructures, you know, Hungary and, and Romania and, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, Prague and so on. So uh, it's going up. And as we are going up, you know, of course, we are traversing new regimes of physics. So the first one, you know, we, we uh, and Donna said it, you know, we, we started to really observe multi-photon ionization differently and so on, uh, and, 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 and uh, 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 observe what she was saying. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and so we climbed up this, this, this uh, uh, as we climb up the intensity, then we go into uh, relativistic optics. Why relativistic optics? Because for the first times, you know, when you have, when you can see something, this means that you have, been, you have electrons with, which are agitated, and because they are agitated, they are really move, 
producing light which are coming and striking your eyes. Uh, okay, so, but in a case of when you are passing uh, 10 to the 18 watt per square centimeter or so, then what happens is now the electrons in your atoms move by a large amount and move uh, at, at the speed of light. So the electrons, not the light, but the electrons are really moving at the speed of light. So, uh, so that's, a, that's a very interesting regime, you know, which leads to a lot of effect and, uh, and, and so on. So. Uh, now, of course, if you are pushing, this is what we are trying to do now, if you are pushing the intensity up, you know, like we are trying to do with Apollon, Eli, and so on, then you, you go into the re ultra-relativistic regime, and this time it is because not only the electrons can be moved at the speed of light, but also the protons, protons which are massive, they are 2,000 times uh, the, uh, the mass of the electrons, so they are more massive, but at 10 to the 25 or so, what per square centimeter, they move at the speed of light. And that's going to be very important. Then finally, if we push even the, uh, in, uh, in, uh, the intensity even higher, and I won't say exactly how we're going to do that, Jonathan Wheeler in the, in the audience, and uh, he can, we can talk about it, but uh, so we go into this regime where light interacts with vacuum, okay? Like my friend Pissinchen says, we are boiling the vacuum, okay? We are really uh, um, uh, separating the um, particles, uh, real particles and uh, virtual, virtual par particles in vacuum, and this is what we can do. And at this, this regime, which is 10 to the 28, 10 to the 29, what per square centimeters, okay. And basically what we do is we materialize the value vacuum, okay. Anyway, so uh, moving right along, okay. Uh, again. So now, uh, there's one thing, if we go back to the regimes, you know, at 10 to the 14 and so on, you know, then we, we can really use these femtosecond lasers, uh, so we don't uh, add, uh, for instance, to, to uh, micro-machines, uh, to remove, to ablate material very, very precisely. The reason is uh, femtosecond lasers are so good for that is because if you are using, for example, a continuous laser and you're shining the continuous laser on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a target, then you are going finally to heat the so all volumes of a target, so you cannot really micro-machine with that. Now, if you are using pulses which are um, uh, much shorter nanosecond, na uh, nanosecond, la nanosecond uh, pulses, which is, for us, is infinity, you know, uh, it's very long, uh, but you do better, because, uh, of course, the heat doesn't have the time to propagate between, between before the uh, block is... is um, it's, it's, uh, it's molten. And, uh, and then you have the uh, femtosecond laser where you come with a very, very short pulse and you deposit the energy and the, 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 the temperature, I mean the heat, doesn't have the time to propagate and you make these very nice holes. And it's a very, very precise uh, uh, way to really ablate the materials. And uh, this gives you some idea, you know, uh, of what you could do, what you can do. In fact, very easily now it's really uh, uh, widely, widely, widely done everywhere. And <clears throat> you can see that we can really make holes and so on uh, very precisely. There is no collateral damage, you know, it's very clean and very small. Okay, you see that we have feature size, which is less than the micrometers, you know, in, in size, and no damages. So, of course, now, uh, one beautiful way to use this, this, uh, this, uh, this laser is to, is to do uh, 
um, eye surgery because after all eyes, you know, is some biological tissue and also is, is not the, the kind of things where you have to be accurate with eyes. And uh, uh, so we thought about that. In fact, we thought because uh, we had this little mishap happening in my lab. And this is one of, uh, one of my students uh, who is in the audience, you know, uh, got a line in the laser, got a laser in his eyes. And, and immediately, you know, we took the, the student, you know, to the hospital, and they met, they met an uh, ophthalmologist who is also here, Ron Kurtz, and, um, and uh, so Ron Kurtz looked at the at detailed do eyes, both are, are here, and he said, wow, this is very strange. And yes, he got hit by the laser, but it's strange. And so did Ardu, he said, what, what is strange? Well, it's strange because the damage on your retina is perfect. So that immediately, you know, of course, you know, we had the University of Michigan, you know, uh, uh, excited about it, they put some money in it, and, and, and then we had, that started the field of femtosecond laser, which is a very, uh, very important field. Okay, so this is just to give you an, an idea what we can do, you know, on the um, on, on, uh, on, uh, uh, cornea, we can use it for all kinds of things, you know, we can, uh, on, in ophthalmology, and uh, um, so it was, very exciting. In fact, so if you are, I'm just show here, if you have a, a, a 50 picosecond laser, which is long for us, okay, and or if you have a 300 femtosecond, you can, you see, you can really create this flap, you know, very, very nicely, you know, and, uh, and, and this is being done, you know, now is also, also uh, 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 m few, few ophthalmologists here in the audience, and it's great. So now uh, I, I had, I had a movie showing this creation of a flap. But I have to say that, and some after some comments, people say, "Well, if you show this, this, uh, this movie, uh, maybe some people are not going to stand it, you know, for it because it's." Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to show it. Okay. <laughs> And I will save some time for busy. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you want really to talk about that, here you have specialists. You have at least three, at, at least three uh, specialists, you know, on, on, on this thing here. Okay, now let's go back to my uh, to my uh, my roadmap here. Uh, and so, as I said, you know, so we were here for a short while, and now we are climbing up. As I said. We are in this area right now, and what's exciting here, you know, when um, we are, sorry, which slide is that? Yeah, uh, when we, when you are in this area of, of uh, you know, 10 to the 20 and 25, etc., when you are shining uh, the laser over a very small size, I mean, small spot size, uh, like Donna said, wavelength of light then you are producing these humongous intensities and you are producing uh, particles, you know, uh, of uh, any kind of particles, any kind of radiations with very large re uh, energy, okay? Uh, very freely, okay? It's amazing. And uh, so uh, this is a, we call a universal source of high energy particle and radiations. And this and this type of, of course, uh, of, of work is being done at Lund, you know, uh, uh, not very, well, uh, not very, I mean, in Sweden, anyway. Uh, and and um, if you uh, are interested, uh, there are people here. Okay, so now, what we, are, what we want to do now is we are producing, we, we, this was an idea uh, from Tajima and Dawson. Toshi Tajima is a very good friend of mine. 
um, of a lot of people also. And he had this, this idea in 1979. He said, well, you know, uh, looking at ducks or whatever uh, on the lake, uh, you know, uh, looking at surf, uh, surfer and so on, he said, well, maybe we should reuse the same effect that is being used by surfer in order really to get particles moving. So they, they, they really wrote this very nice uh, paper. But of course, it's 1979. So it's before 1985. So uh, I didn't know about this effect, you know, and Toshi didn't know about the CPA, okay? So, but fortunately, we had, we had scientists at uh, NRL, Naval Research Lab, who, or, who really were able really to saw the potential to put the, the two concepts, CPA and laser wake field accelerations, you know, together in order to accelerate particles. And this is what is going on now in the many, many laboratories in the world. You have lasers here, and you shine the laser on this uh, gas jet, and, and you're producing a plasma, you know, which is a plasma is a kind of a soup of electrons and, 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 and protons and so on. And you are creating this wave, these plasma waves, where the electrons are going to be trapped and dragged at the speed of light, you know, by this wave. Okay, so this now, it is really, we were talking last night with Olga, this is really, is the future for electron accelerations. And uh, for, is if, because we have, they have problems in, in high energy physics. They have problems because they have to build these huge accelerators. Here you have the CERN accelerator, the LHC, uh, 27 kilometer in circumference here, you know, and 170 meters underground. So it's, it's, it's really, of course, it costs enormous amount of, ener of, of, uh, of money. And now because for the, the next step, the next, next collider is going to be even bigger, okay, and will cost really an, aff an affordable uh, amount of money. So really, it is very important really to come, to, to come and, and with the new technology. And you think that if you're really replacing the technology used right now in this, uh, uh, in, in this uh, case, for instance, which is you were using radio frequency, radio, microwave and so on, uh, where you have uh, the gradients is of the order of less than 100 meters uh, 100, I'm sorry, 100 MeV per meters. Uh, that's the reason why you have 27 kilometers. But if you now are using this novel technique, the, the Toshi's, uh, Tajima's uh, idea to accelerate particles, then uh, you, you could really fit, you know, a CERN, in principle, okay, uh, a CERN on a football field. Okay, so this is pretty good, okay? But, uh, you know, of course, we like with Toshi to look ahead all the time. And <clears throat> uh, so uh, some people, you know, in the agencies have difficulty to, to see that, you know, and, uh, and, but anyway, this is the way we are, okay? And so uh, we like to look ahead. And so right now, the, let me uh, tell you that uh, we can produce now something like uh, devices, uh, GEV devices, are centimeter size, okay? Now we can produce up to five GEVs, but five GEVs is, is something like 10 centimeters in length, okay? And yes, we could really maybe put CERN on the football field, but could we do much, much better than that? And right now, and the reason is yes, yes, uh, <clears throat> we could, in fact, and I'm not pulling your leg here, 
Okay. I, I, uh, we could already, in fact, uh, um, make the, 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 the accelerator, a kind of TEV accelerator, on a fingertip. And, and by, by doing what? Okay. Uh, instead of using gas, which has, which has a very low uh, density of electrons, then we have to use, we would like to use solid. Solid, and uh, <clears throat> so you have six order of magnitude larger amount of electrons, okay, because we are working also with gas at low, low density gas. And, <clears throat> and then, but you say, well, but I mean, now light won't be able to propagate through the solid at this very high intensity. And so we say, okay, fine, but if we can, if we can really develop a high, high intensity X-ray now, so that is, instead of working in a visible, work in the X-ray regime, then with the X-rays, high intensity can penetrate into, uh, into the solid and to produce this wake field. This is exactly what we are doing right now, you know, at, at, the, um, at, uh, at uh, the Ecole Polytechnique and in collaboration with, of course, with Toshida Jima at Irvine and also with some people from the ELI, okay? Because I, we think really this is really maybe the future, uh, trying to work with laser wake field accelerations in in, in, uh, in the high energy X-ray regime. So we, uh, we, have, we have ways to do that. I don't have the time to, to show it, but it's really, I think it, there is really new, new avenue to do that. Now, yeah, I just a, a quick reminder that uh, there is this uh, three phenomenal, three phenomenal uh, facilities which are being built by the European Union and which are really in, in uh, uh, Czech Republic, in Hungary, and in Romania, where you have absolutely three beautiful facilities. Facilities where not the, where really doing different things. They don't do three times the same thing, of course. And, uh, they, 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 and, and it's absolutely fabulous to have in few years, you know, we will have them working and welcoming large amount of users. And uh, um, uh, so, and, and Eli, for instance, is very close to get to the 10 petawatt uh, uh, objective. Now, uh, now, you know, what is, ex is there's a big application coming back to, to uh, uh, societal applications. There's a very important applications uh, if you can produce beams of particles. Let's suppose that you can put, you can really produce beams of protons. Well, you know, protons therapy, for example, for cancer and so on, is really the, um, the, the, really the therapy of choice, okay? Because the protons, not like other radiation of particles, they don't burn the tissue between, be, between really uh, the, the, um, the skin and the tumors. You can really uh, address the tumors almost, you know, uniquely, so you can deposit your proton uh, exactly in a tumor. Uh, now, also, what is nice about uh, having these high-intensity lasers is you, is you can make uh, particles, and uh, these particles, you know, can be radionuclides and, uh, and so on, and you can use them, you know, to implant uh, uh, um, uh, these particles into, um, into the, uh, near the tumor or in the tumor of, of the patient. Uh, also, you can uh, uh, use this, this, um, this um, radioisotopes and so on, but you, you know, which uh, uh, in order to do all kind of diagnostics and so on. 
So this, uh, this uh, CPA, I mean CPA, uh, high intensity or extremely light, extremely extreme light inten intensity uh, or lasers, you know, are really very useful, but will be very useful in 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 medical world. Now there's also another applications, but this is dreaming. But I like to dream anyway, so. I did that all my life and made my, made my living with that. And so, uh, anyway, so uh, there's one, one really big problem we have. And this also, together with Toshi, we're working on it. And uh, by the way, we're not working because it's easy, but it's going to be, we're working on it because it's difficult. Okay? And what we want really to do is to transmute, transmute uh, uh, nuclear waste because we have all nuclear energy is maybe the, the best candidate for the future, but you are still you are still you know uh, left with a lot of this junk, dangerous junk, and and that's the reason Toshi you know, invented the terms now toilet science. It's time to do toilet science. It's time to to clean up what we have produced, you know, uh, producing the energy and so on for our living. And, uh, so, and uh, so the idea now, of course, is, is uh, <coughs> we, have, we have to find ways, okay, to uh, mitigate, you know, this uh, nuclear waste. And one way will be maybe to transmute this, this, this uh, nuclear waste into in a new, new, new form of uh, atoms which are not, uh, which don't, don't have this problem of radioactivity. And so what you have to do is to change uh, the making of the nucleus, okay? Uh, of, uh, so for example, if you have, a, if you have a nucleus uh, uh, atoms A, okay, and you have an isotope A, and which is maybe radioactive for a long time. So like, take the example of technetium, for instance, and which can be radioactive for 100,000 of years. Then if you can, if you can really lodge a, a, a neutrons, because now we, know, we, we have freedom, we know, we know that we can produce any kind of particles, you know, including neutrons, uh, we can produce neutrons, you know, in, in this um, in the nucleus, then you are changing the isotope uh, A into an isotope B. But this time, it can have really now a radioactivity time release of, uh, of the order of seconds. Of course, this is the most favorable case, but so we would like to extend the concept, you know, to um, uh, to, of course, uh, the nuclear waste, which are really polluting our life right now. So, and, so by the way, sometimes you, have, you are lucky, and uh, this isotope uh, B becomes isotope C, and it's, it's uh, stable, so it doesn't emit anything. Uh, <clears throat> so, in conclusion, for me, is extreme light is capable of generating the largest fields, the largest accelerations, the largest temperature, and the largest pressure. Just with light, it's amazing. And it carries the best hope and opportunity for the future of science and technology. So, thank you very much. And I would like to add that you know, we are doing this it's a very rich field right now, uh, the field of um, extreme light, but I think the best is yet to come. Thank you very much. This concludes the physics lectures.
for this year's Nobel Prize 2018. I would like to extend my profound thanks again to our three eminent speakers, Dr. Essiambo, Dr. Donna Strickland, and Dr. Mourou for wonderful talks. And having said that, I would finally like to invite our Nobel laureates, Donna Strickland and Gérard Mourou, to come up on stage with me so that you may congratulate them again to this year's prize. So please. <laughs>